I think I'd be ignorant to say that Christianity is the only right religion. I don't know what the right religion is. It's just what I believe it is. Some people that I've met, it's just I, I've had friends, and and the minute they find out about me, or the minute that I I do anything that doesn't follow their religion, I'm they they don't want anything to do with me. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad that can come out of it. And I'm not sure if it's from religion that the bad or the good comes out of it or whether it's the people. I respect a lot of faiths and I think that Christianity is a pillar that's influenced by the other great religions in the world. La cristianidad es muy importante porque podemos aprender valores cristianos donde no podemos, uh, donde descubrimos más acerca de nosotros. My view on anyone who claims to have a monopoly on truth is that there's no one truth about anything. I think that a lot of religions say the same thing in different ways. Well, a few years ago, I was driving uh, somewhere in Chicago. I don't often go to the city, and I was in an area I had not really been to before, and it was back in the days before smartphones and GPS technology, so I was using older technology called a map. Uh, and I was trying to look at the map, and I was in traffic, and there was a light, and I was trying to read the street signs, and I was a little bit lost, and then all of a sudden the light changed, the guy behind me starts honking, so I just turned not even noticing the big one-way sign right on the corner. Uh, so the first thing I noticed when I turned on that street was all the cars on both sides of the road were parked facing me. And I thought, huh, all these people are parked the wrong way. <laughs> and then I noticed the guy driving right at me in my lane. I thought, that guy's going the wrong way. And then he started honking and gesturing. And then I noticed people are walking on the sidewalk, gesturing at me. And I realized I was the one going the wrong way. Anyone ever done that? <laughs> well, I turned as quickly as I could onto a street going the correct way. But as soon as I turned, the police officer turned on his lights. He had seen me, pulled me over, and I waited for him to come to my window. He came to my window and he said, sir, you know you're going the wrong way on a one-way street? I said, yes, I do now. And then I just made, I just said, look, I'm not really familiar with this area. I got a little lost. I panicked. And I didn't see the sign. I'm sorry. It's my fault. And then he looked at me and he said, well, you probably should pay more attention. And he just let me off with a warning. Now, I tell that story because of what did not occur to me in that moment. It never occurred to me in that moment to argue with the officer about the one-way sign. You know, I really find that one-way sign to be kind of offensive. <laughs> because I would really rather go whichever way I'd like to go. I mean, who has the authority to tell me which way to go? I didn't think to do that, obviously, and you wouldn't think to do that either because I understand that someone, some group, has the authority to establish that law and that it's for my good and it's for the good of everybody around me. Now, we're in the fourth week, as I said, of a series called Explore God. We've already looked at some really significant questions. Does life have a purpose? Is there a God? Why does God allow pain and suffering? And today we take on the fourth question, is Christianity too narrow? Now, before we get into this, I want you to see that in that question itself, just to ask the question, demands two assumptions that we need to see. They're hidden in the question. The first assumption hidden in that question is that narrow is always bad in some way. Just ask the question. It's asking in a way that makes us assume that, bad, that narrow must be bad. And we all know that that's not true. There are times when narrow is actually quite good. For example, you go to your dentist. Your dentist says you have an infected tooth. And the only way to save that tooth is a root canal. Now, if your dentist says that, you're not going to be overjoyed, but you're probably not going to be offended either. You're probably going to gladly choose his one-way option, root canal, over losing a tooth for the rest of your life. And by the way, that's happened to me on a couple of occasions. Secondly, the, assumption, the second assumption that's in that question is that the Christian faith somehow is more narrow than all other faith systems in the world. That it's more narrow. The truth is all Religious systems in the world are narrow in their own way. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. I believe this question is asked more about Christianity than any other religion because of something Jesus himself actually said in the New Testament. In John chapter 14, Jesus is uh, coming toward the end of his 
ministry and life, and he's preparing his disciples for his, his impending death. And so here's what he says, John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. He's talking about heaven, the eternal kingdom of God. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So, right in the middle of that passage, Jesus makes a claim that lies at the very center of the question we ask today. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, he says, there is one way to God, one way to heaven, one way to salvation, and I am that way. Now, understandably, to many in our world today, that sounds very, very narrow, very, very exclusive, and even offensive. So today I want to look at three things. I want to look at first the question of truth, and then look at the problem with truth, and then look at the truth of Christ. First, the question of truth. Uh, This past week, I took a quick trip uh, with one of my sons. He was making kind of a bucket list trip to northern Arizona, southern Utah, to see some of the natural wonders in that part of the country. And one night, uh, we were out, uh, he was trying to take some photos, and when the sky was just crystal clear at night. And if you've been to that part of the country, it, it, the stars are just overwhelming. It was a beautiful cr- crystal clear night. So he, he pointed his camera upward, set the setting on whatever setting he set it on, and he took a picture of the Milky Way, taken by him just this past week. Uh, just an amazing evening, an, an amazing view, overwhelming. But that photo that he sent me um, reminded me of a class I had to take in college. A class, it was a science class for non-science majors called Project Phys- Physics. We called it Bonehead Physics because none of us were science majors. And one day in that class, I still remember, the professor asked a question. He said, why is the sky dark at night? And my buddies and I are sitting in the back of the class, and we kind of went, Pfft. The sun goes down. And then he went on to explain that with billions of stars in the universe, that when we look up at night, there ought to be a point of light at every single point. The sky should be filled with starlight. Why is it dark? And then he went on to explain that the sky is dark because of something called the red shift. I still don't know if I can explain it or even understand it. But it has to do with the fact that the universe is still expanding and most of the stars are receding from us so at speeds so great that the light itself is shifted out of our visible spectrum. We can't see it. It's called the red shift. At that moment, my friend sitting next to me, whose name was Mike, slammed shut his textbook and said quietly to himself, I don't have to believe that. And I think that's the response many have to the claims of the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul summarizes the core of the Christian gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read these words for you. Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What I want you to see there is Paul says the Christian gospel begins with the claim, Christ died for our sins. To which many respond, I don't have to believe that. I don't really believe in the idea of sin, and I don't think I have to be saved from anything. Then Paul says the very center of the gospel is the claim that Christ rose from the dead. To which many will say, I don't have to believe that. Science tells me that resurrection from the dead is physically impossible. Therefore, 
Why should I believe something that science tells me is impossible? Now, I want you to see these are perfectly reasonable responses from someone who has lived in a culture that no longer uses the word sin at all and believes that science has proved there is no God. Perfectly reasonable responses to the claims of the Christian gospel. But before we even get into the specific claims of the Christian faith, I think we have to talk a little bit about truth itself. It seems to me there are only three sources for truth. First, what might be called transcendent or universal truth. These are things that are true all the time, everywhere, throughout history and in every human culture. For example, almost every civilization throughout human history has assumed that there are certain moral laws that are always true. For example, it's always wrong to take a human life. It's always wrong to abuse a child. It's always wrong to take something that doesn't belong to you. Those are things that every world religion will claim are, 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 come from a source outside of humanity, from whatever God or force in the universe you think exists, and they're always true. So universal truth, transcendent truth. Secondly, second source of truth is, is the individual, is you and me. Uh, that is, in fact, the gospel of our age, that preaches there is no universal objective truth. You have to follow your own truth. You have to speak your own truth. That the individual has the right and the responsibility to create their own truth and then live by that. That's why many people respond to what Jesus says when he says, I am the way, the truth. They respond with offense or they find it difficult to accept because they've been taught they are the source of truth in themselves. The problem with this source of truth is when my definition of truth and your definition of truth collide. We have a problem. We see this all the time, every day in the political world. And so I think we would probably agree that the thoughts and desires of the individual are kind of a shaky place to establish truth. There is a third source, however, and that's culture. Truth is what my culture says it is, sort of like majority rule. So if my culture says slavery is okay because it helps the economy, then that becomes truth for me. Or if my culture says uh, eliminating, exterminating an entire people group because they are less than human is okay, then that becomes truth for me. Or if it says living lives of conspicuous consumption are okay when most of the world goes to bed hungry every night, then that becomes truth for me. Right? So I think we could all agree that the cultural source of truth is also a rather poor standard. By and large, our culture today, where we live, teaches us that science is what gives us truth. That if it can be measured, if it can be duplicated, if it can be explained through the natural universe, then it's true. If not, then it's not true. So the gospel of our age again. The Christian faith is founded as Paul says, on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Science tells us that's impossible, therefore it must be a fairy tale to many. The Christian worldview is that all truth, whether in the material world or in the spiritual realm, belongs to God, and therefore is revealed by God. Truth is not something that human beings create, it's something that we discover. And that's what my friend objected to all those years ago in Project Physics class, when he said, I don't have to believe that. When he said that, he wasn't saying that what the professor was saying was not true. He was saying he did not want it to be true. And that's a whole different thing. That leads us to the second thing we need to talk about, and that is the problem with truth. Today, as we all know, some 80,000 football fans will gather at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, paying an average of $4,600 a ticket and some as high as $25,000 a ticket to watch Super Bowl 53. Right? You're aware of that, right? It's going on today. Super Bowl. Now, there are several things we know with great certainty. First, we know that the Patriots and the Rams are playing in the game. Just for fun, how many Patriots fans are here today? How many Rams fans? How many don't really care? Good for you. All right. We know that millions will gather in homes and Super Bowl parties just to watch the game together. We know, did you know this? We know that 1.3, this just cracks me up, 1.3 billion chicken wings will be conserved today in America alone. That's four wings for every man, woman, and child in our nation. Enough to circle the globe three times just with chicken wings. (laughs) 
Are you going to do your part? We know the commercials will cost $5 million for 30 seconds. That's $166,000 per second if you're keeping score. Now, while we do know that one, we don't, while we don't know which team is going to win the game, we do know that at the end of the game, there will be a winner and there will be a loser, right? Uh, there might be a bad call or two. <laughs> there might be a doinked field goal or two. I really hope there is. Uh, there will be a debate about whether or not the missed calls affected the outcome of the game, but there won't be any debate about the final score. It will be right there on the scoreboard. It won't be up for a vote. It won't be up for opinion. It will be right there. That's the problem with truth. All truth is exclusive in one way or another. Another way to say it is that all truth is narrow by definition. For example, consider the truth of gravity. You know, it's holding you in your pew right now. A fr if a friend of you told you one day, you know, called you, emailed you, told you, said, hey, um, I learned how to fly. You would say, well, when did you become a pilot? That's awesome. They said, well, no, 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 I'm not a pilot. I, I know how to fly. I'm jumping off the Sears Tower today, or whatever they call it now. I want you to come watch. You would probably be concerned about your friend for a number of reasons. One of them being, you know the truth of gravity is universal. It's exclusive. It's narrow. We don't get to choose when it applies to us or not. Or consider maybe the truth of mathematics. You go to your bank, set up a meeting with the manager, and say, you know, I got this, I got this uh, you sent me my account report, and it's wrong. They say, well, show me. Well, it says right here, you're, you're telling me I have $100 in my account, but by my math, I have $100,000 in my account. I'd like you to use my math, please. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. So when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he is clearly making a statement of truth that is exclusive and, in a sense, narrow. One of the most common objections to the Christian faith goes like this. All religions are essentially the same. All religions help people find God. So how can one be right and all the others be wrong? How can there be one way? I actually got an email last week from a young person I know. In part, here's what it said. Pastor Brian, traveling to so many different places and working with people of so many different cultures has really made me scrutinize my faith. I can't really come to the belief that we as Christians have it right and everyone else has got it wrong. Humans are so diverse, we all have an internal desire to seek something grander than ourselves, intangible, holy, and I honestly believe everyone's divine path is unique. To me, to believe in the resurrection of Jesus is to denounce any other existing religion or belief. I feel comfortable in a mosque, temple, church. Aren't we all trying to connect to the same place? I have great appreciation for the honesty and the wrestling going on in that person. But I had to gently respond that to say all religions are essentially the same is actually quite disrespectful to all religions. And on top of that, it's, to say that is logically flawed. And let me explain why. In logic, there's something called the law of non-contradiction. It was first articulated, I think, by Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, in like 350 B.C., and it goes something like this. Two statements that are contradictory cannot both be true in the same way at the same time. It's just common sense. For example, if I say I'm six foot one inches tall, and then in my next breath say I'm seven feet tall, they both can't be true at the same time in the same way. We know that. Or if I say Jesus is God, and then I say Jesus is not God, those both can't be true at the same time in the same way. We get that. And here's why it matters. While each of the great world religions is similar in that they all acknowledge human beings longing for and need for God, they, vis they, they differ vastly in how they describe God and what they teach about God. And they're all very narrow in some way because they all claim truth. Even a superficial understanding demonstrates this. Let me take you through some things. Islam, for example teaches that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Islam teaches that salvation is a result of following faithfully the five pillars of Islam. That is, reciting the Shahada, 
prayer, praying five times a day, facing Mecca, giving alms to the poor, observing the fast of Ramadan, and uh, completing a pilgrimage to Mecca sometime in your life. And if you do all those things faithfully, then you hope for the mercy of Allah. You hope for the mercy of Allah. They don't guarantee it, but you hope for it. Islam does not teach that Allah became flesh and dwelt among us. Islam does not teach that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. In fact, it t- tells, says specifically Jesus did not die on the cross and did not rise from the dead. Very different from what Christians believe. Hinduism teaches that Brahman is the universal soul manifested in millions of personal gods and goddesses and that nirvana is reached by a series of reincarnated lifetimes based on karma. So if you're born into a poor family, it means you lived a lousy previous life and you're being punished for that. You've got to try again, try again, try again. Very different from what Christians believe. Buddhism does not teach the existence of a personal God at all. Rather, teaches basically that life is suffering and that suffering is caused by desires. And we eliminate desire from our life by living according to the eightfold path that Buddha lived out for us. Very different from what Christians believe. Christianity is not only the, mo- the largest and most widespread faith in the world, I'll talk about that more in just a minute, it is also the most unique. Where every other major world religion teaches that human beings' way to God is accomplished through keeping a long set of religious rules and rituals and behaviors and requirements, Christianity teaches the opposite. It's not based on what people do for God, it's based on what God did for us. Christianity turns religion upside down. Here's the point. If all major religions teach different things about God, they can all not be true in the same way at the same time. So we just can't say all religions are the same. All roads lead to God. That's like saying all roads lead to Elburn. Not only is it not true, it's also rather foolish to say as well. So the question is, how can we know what is true? How can Christianity teach that Jesus is the only way? I would encourage all of you, if you struggle with that question, most people have it sometime or another, how to explain it. Next week we talk about, is Jesus God? The week after, is the Bible reliable? They both speak into this same question. But I want to finish by talking thirdly about the truth of Christ. So we have the question of truth, the problem with truth, and now the truth of Christ. Go back to the story of me driving the wrong way on the one-way street and the officer that stopped me. I didn't argue with them. I didn't argue about the injustice of the one-way sign, limiting my freedom. I just admitted, I'm, I was going the wrong way. Uh, I was in violation of that particular law. Even though my law-breaking was, was unintentional, the fact was I was a law-breaker. The biblical language for that would be sinner. What I deserved was justice. In that case, a ticket attached to a fine. But what I received instead was something else. He let me off with a warning. What I received was grace, the gift of grace. Now, at the center of the Christian faith is this idea called grace. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. What is grace? Grace, Paul says, is the gift of God. Grace is the undeserved favor of That comes from God. Grace is not fairness. Grace is not karma. Grace is not getting what you deserve. Our culture is consumed with getting what you deserve. It's not that. Grace is not religion. Grace is receiving a gift that you could never earn or deserve. Grace. So grace, properly understood, is the exact opposite of narrow. Grace is wildly inclusive. Now to understand grace, we do have to understand sin. And to understand sin, we do have to understand truth. And those three words, properly understood, not only tell us everything we need to know about what the Christian faith is, but also explain to us what's wrong with the world, what's broken inside of me, and how there is hope for us all. Grace, sin, and truth. There's an ugly yet beautiful story that comes to us in John chapter 8 that demonstrates this. A group of religious men drag a woman before Jesus. They say, 
Master, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Lots of questions about how they determine that, but they drag her in front of Jesus uh, because they're using her as a prop to trap Jesus into saying something they can, they can criticize him for. They said, the law requires us to stone such a woman. Our religion requires us to punish her. What do you say? And then Jesus does something different. First, he speaks truth. He says to all those men, let the one of you who is without sin at all throw the first stone. They all know he's speaking truth, so they drop the stones and they walk away. And then he looks at the woman, who we, whose name we don't have. We just know she was being shamed in front of her entire community. He looks at her and says, where have they all gone? Does no one condemn you? Neither do I. That's grace. Neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Then he says, now go and leave your life of sin. That's transformation. What we need to see there is that Jesus does it, shows us a different way. It's grace first, then transformation. Jesus himself summarizes the Christian gospel in John chapter 3 when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Notice, God so loved, not Jews, Jesus was a Jew. God so loved, not Romans, Jews and Romans hated each other, not Americans, not educated, civilized, reasonably good people. God so loved the world that whoever, whoever, whoever believes in him will receive everlasting life. Tim Keller, in his book, Making Sense of God, writes, one of the unique things about Christianity is that it's the only truly worldwide faith, he says. I stopped and I read that again, and then he went on to explain. I want you to imagine in your mind a map of the world. Okay, just imagine a map of the world. We all know, know what that looks like, all the continents and so forth. Well, here's what's true. 90% of Muslims live in a band from Southeast Asia across the Middle East and into Northern Africa. Uh, there's a narrow band where 90% of the Muslims in the world live. 95% of the Hindus in the world live in, the immediate, live in India and the immediate area. It's one little spot in the world. 88% of the Buddhists that exist in the world live in East Asia. It's, it's collected right there. But Christianity is vastly different. For example, 25% of all Christians in the world live in Europe, if you stretch from Great Britain all the way through the, end of the, east, the eastern end of Russia, that huge swath. Okay, 25% of the Christians in the world live there. 25% of the Christians in the world live in Central and South America. 22% of the Christians in the world live in Africa, and that's growing rapidly. 15% of the Christians in the world live in China, and that's also growing rapidly. Estimates are that within 20 years, there'll be over 100 million believers in China alone. 12% of the Christians in the world live in North America, where we live. Only 12%. Why? Christianity does not seem bound by cultural, ethnic, or economic barriers. We have to ask why. Why is that so? Because, I think, at the center of the gospel is not religion, not culture, not ethnicity, not education, not economics, but grace. The undeserved favor of God through Christ, who offers to whoever believes a new heart through forgiveness of sin, new identity by being adopted as his children, new purpose by living for his kingdom, a new destiny to dwell with him forever in new heaven and new earth. Whoever. Not to those who go to church three times a week, not to those who pray ten times a day, not to those who give enough of their money, to whoever believes Jesus is the way. There are absolutely no requirements made other than faith. I want you to hear that again. There are no requirements at all other than faith. Grace first, then comes change and transformation. That's the gospel. So, we started with the question, is Christianity too narrow? Most of us know uh, the basic outline of the tragic story of the Titanic. 
maybe you saw the movie or maybe you read the book or you've seen pictures or whatever. And this is uh, probably one of the most uh, overused preaching illustrations of all time, but it's very clear. We know the story. On its very first voyage in 1912, hits an iceberg, sinks in two and a half hours, taking the lives of over 1,500 people out of the 2,200 passengers. The part of the story I find particularly interesting and tragic is that of all the lifeboats that were launched after the captain gave the abandoned ship command, most of them were only half full of people. That's remarkable. It took two and a half hours. There was plenty of time. Now, there are a lot of reasons why those boats were launched half full, but researchers has, have found that one of the reasons those lifeboats launched half full was that many, many people standing on the deck of the Titanic refused to believe it was sinking. They'd gotten on that ship because it was billed as the unsinkable Titanic. And after it hit the iceberg, the, ca the captain gave the command, the boat sort of leveled out. People felt it sort of level out. Ah, and they thought, we're fine. It's unsinkable. But the captain, a man named Edward Smith, already knew what was happening beneath the deck. He knew, his engineers told him, these chambers are filling with water. He knew when enough of them filled with water, that ship was going down. So he gave the command. Now, here's the question. When the captain gave the command to abandon ship, get in those lifeboats, was he being narrow? Well, yes, that was the only way to survive. But was he being arrogant or intolerant or unloving? Of course not. Of course not. The issue was not narrowness. The issue was truth. If it was true that that ship was sinking, the captain's order was actually the most loving and compassionate thing he could do. Now, in the same way, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. The issue is not narrowness. The issue is truth. If Jesus was just a deluded ancient man, or if he was blatantly lying, deceiving people, then we just all need to look elsewhere. We need to look elsewhere. But if he was telling the truth, then it's the most compassionate and loving thing he could say. The issue is not narrowness. The issue is truth. We're going to close our time this morning at the table of the Lord when we remember what Jesus did to accomplish grace, to make grace available to us. Uh, the ushers are going to come forward in just a moment. We'll pass out the trays. Just hold the elements that already is received, and I'll lead us through this remembrance of the Lord's Supper. We, let's bow with me in prayer. Lord, thank you for not leaving us on our own to, forget, to figure out the mystery of truth. Thank you for giving us yourself. Thank you for giving us more than the rules and requirements of religion. Thank you for the gift of grace that invites us all, welcomes all, and transforms all. Remind us again through bread and cup. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.